All right, so in chapter five, uh, entitled, It's Just Markets All the Way Down, uh, the main point of discussion is about, okay, now that we've established what a demand curve looks like and a supply curve looks like, and we've talked a little bit about equilibrium, we'll talk a lot more about equilibrium, specifically equilibrium formation in chapter six, but, but we've talked about equilibrium and, and what that means in the context of competitive markets. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to extend that conversation uh, about markets down to what we're going to refer to as factor markets. Uh, factor markets are the markets that businesses purchase their inputs, uh, which are used in the production of their outputs. As we talked about in chapter four, uh, with the concept of the production function, uh, producers have inputs which they use to produce their output, uh, provide whatever good or service uh, that that business happens to be in. And so in this chapter, we're gonna go a little bit more in depth on that business side. So we get a nice full picture of what markets really mean. Um, oftentimes in principles of economics courses, you won't necessarily get um, as much of a treatment when it comes to factor markets. We may define factor markets, but we don't necessarily go into, into much detail. In my class, I like to go into more detail uh, with respect to factor markets because I think it provides a much fuller picture of what's actually going on in markets. So when you go to a store and you buy something off the shelf, you will now, uh, at least philosophically, understand a lot more of, of the decision-making and the broadness of that decision making of how that product got to the store shelf or the service got to wherever it is uh, that you received that particular service. Um, in the beginning of chapter five, uh, we come across this um, particular figure, um, which is the way that I like to think about market economic systems. And so the way in which market economic systems and the sort of so-called invisible hand work is that you have all of these components uh, in an economic system which are sort of codependent upon each other. Um, you know, producers are dependent upon capital markets. They're dependent upon labor markets. Uh, consumers are dependent upon, uh, you know, those markets as well, uh, both in the context of buying the products that, that we want or need to buy, but also in, in the context of, of labor decisions and the jobs that we have and the incomes um, that those create. And so what I want you to do now is instead of just sort of thinking about a market from a supply and demand framework, I mean, that's certainly going on. And that's certainly one way in which we can tell the story of consumer decisions and firm decisions. But now what we can do is we can take a little bit of a step back and we can think about the supply and demand uh, from that market and specifically the supply of the goods in that market as coming from other parts of an economic system, which are certainly uh, worth discussing. Um, the, the components that we will mostly uh, talk about today are the labor and capital market, again, what we refer to as factor markets. Um, the labor market uh, stems from, you know, consumers wishing to consume goods or needing to consume goods in, in most circumstances and offering their labor as a means to generate wages to do so. Right? So this is the, the exchange component of a labor market. I have bills I need to pay, I have goods and services that I want to buy. And so I need to have a job, I need to be paid a wage so that I can do those various activities. Uh, and so as a result, I offer my time, my labor in exchange for a resource. And, and luckily in the 21st century, you know, that resource is money. Back in the day, of course, you would have all sorts of exchanges for labor, time, and so on and so forth. There's a certain benefit to normalizing a resource like a currency, because then, you know, I get paid in that currency and then I can go buy goods in that currency. And there's, I don't need to exchange that currency in any sort of particular way. So labor, laborers are paid wages. And, and in some sense, the, the wages that labor 
uh, is paid is some you know, function of skills, what we might call human capital. And so these things are feeding themselves into the labor market. And then of course, that leads to firms making particular decisions as to who they want to hire. On the capital market side, we tend to break this up into sort of two components, what we call physical capital. This is computers and vans and office buildings, you know, uh, you know human made physical capital. And then there's what we called natural capital. So this is generated primarily by nature, uh, but still uh, is an input into the production function uh, of a business. And that those two things feed into the capital market. And so what you then have is the capital market and the labor market, which enable the supply of a particular good. And then the fact that people are being paid wages and the fact that people want to buy goods is, of course, creating that demand for a product. So again, we look at supply and demand. If you just sort of look all the way to the right in that kind of, if you think, break this up into sort of like almost columns, that last column with just supply and demand, that's sort of what we see or, and what we think about uh, when we show our typical graphical representation of supply and demand. But I do want you to sort of have an idea that, that there's a lot of decision making that's being fed into that last column. And there are a lot of uh, decisions and choices and constraints and optimization that's going on long before, uh, again, you're purchasing that product off of the store shelf. So, you know, this is in some sense unique to what we might call a market-based economic system, a more capitalist system, where these decisions are truly being made by decisions on the market. If you had a, an economic system in which labor decisions or capital decisions were being made by some uh, central authority, you know, some government, obviously this would look a lot different and it wouldn't have as much natural inertia. So that's one of the nice things about market economies is that they, they tend to kind of move on their own because there's all these, uh, you know, utilities that people are trying to maximize. There's these profits that businesses are trying to maximize. And so the economy in, in a market-based sense tends to kind of work a little bit on its own. This is why we call it the invisible hand. Um, to that point, we can think about the way in which a market-based economic system actually works as being, uh, you know, sort of illustrated by this particular figure here, uh, which is really kind of the way in which capitalism works. And that is that you have markets which are declining, their profits are falling, there's less money to be made in those markets. And as a result, those markets expel capital. They don't buy as much capital. They are often sort of getting rid of their own capital. That capital is going back out onto the market. Or at the very least, you're not seeing capital flow into that market. You're seeing it more uh, sort of flowing out of it. Uh, and the same thing with labor. As the profits in a market decline, the typically wages in that market are also going to decline. And this, of course, causes uh, individuals to not, you know, necessarily want to work in those particular industries. And so labor flows out of those markets. And then, of course, where does it flow? It flows to those uh, industries and those markets uh, where we're seeing profits increase. We refer to those as emerging markets. So sometimes you'll hear this in the context of the stock market, kind of emerging markets. You know, these are markets which have, have been shown to have, you know, high profit potential. And there's a sense that as they become more mature, you're going to see a lot of capital and labor flow into those particular markets. You know, a great example of this that I talk about in the chapter uh, is the, the transition from the typewriter to the personal computer. And so in the 70s and 80s, what you see is the typewriter become, becomes a declining market and the, the personal computer becomes an emerging market. And so as a result, you had, you know, at sometimes the same companies, you know, IBM, for example, uh, used to be a typewriter company. Uh, so you literally had some companies which previously had been operating in, in what was then a declining market, and then they transitioned themselves uh, into an emerging market, in that case, uh, the personal home computer. So, you know, just as sort of a general philosophical way to think about how market-based economic systems work, uh, and to take it a little bit of a step further, in, instead of just looking at one market supply and demand curve, we add a little bit of complexity here uh, in the context of, of the, the two figures that we just went over. Okay, so again, the, the point of chapter five is to really dig a little bit deeper 
into the factor markets that are driving business decisions. Um, we, we know from chapter four, uh, where we looked at the profit function of firms, that the decisions that are being made by firms are being driven by the price that they get in the market they're selling their good for, so the market price. And of course, just to reiterate, in our competitive markets, we uh, generally believe that the firms do not have the ability to set their own prices. So they're, they're responding to market prices. Uh, and, and we would call that an exogenous effect. So an exogenous effect means that this is an effect that's coming from some external source. Here, the market is setting a price and then the firm is reacting to it. And then how the firm reacts to it uh, is, is a function of endogenous considerations. So capital and labor decisions, these are the decisions that are being made inside of the, the firm itself. We call those endogenous uh, decisions. So you have the exogenous effects, the market price, the behavior of competitors, and then you have the endogenous effects. These are the, the decisions that are actually being carried out um, by the individual firm. And those endogenous decisions are, are primarily what we're gonna talk about in this particular lecture. So as we talked about in the previous chapter, we established that producers have a profit function, excuse me, they have a production function um, and we established a, a total cost function. Now in chapter four, that total cost function looked a little bit different than it does in this particular function here. Although this is really just another way of restating the total cost. So in chapter four, we said that total cost was variable cost and fixed cost. Now what we're, we're not saying that the total cost has changed. It's just that instead of calling it variable cost and fixed cost, we're going to refer to total cost as cost coming from capital and labor decisions, which could be variable and could be fixed, right? So uh, capital decisions can have fixed cost. You may sign a lease on a building that you're using as a storefront and you have to pay that lease regardless of whether you actually sell anything. So that's a fixed cost and that would show up in capital cost. You could also have a fixed cost with respect to labor costs where you, uh, some of your employees are on contract with you. And again, you have to pay that contract regardless of whether you actually produce anything. And so it's not to say that we're getting rid of those concepts of variable costs and fixed costs. It's just that we're changing the labels. And now what we're saying is that total cost to a firm is their capital cost, which is this R times K, and we'll get to what R is in just a moment. And then their labor costs are gonna be W times L. Uh, and, and again, just adding those two amounts up is going to what, be what we call the firm's total cost. So total cost to a firm is just their capital decisions uh, plus their labor decisions. Again, very straightforward um, and very uh, to the point. So we can look at the way this changes our profit function. Uh, again, the, the profit function has total revenue at the beginning of it, P times Q. Q is the decision by the firm of how much to produce. And again, part of that decision is being uh, determined by what the market price is. And then of course we have total cost. So this is total revenue, and then this is total cost. And what's total cost? Again, it's just the cost of capital right here, R times K, and then the cost of labor uh, w times L. And we refer to R here as the rental rate of capital and W uh, as the wage rate paid to employees. Uh, I'll explain a little bit later why we call it the rental rate of capital, um, but for right now, we can simply think of it as the price of capital, the, the per unit price of capital, and uh, the wage rate W being the uh, per labor uh, individual cost of employment. So how much it actually costs me to hire an individual. So what this all infers, or rather implies, is that profit decisions are also labor and capital decisions. So back in chapter four, when we talked about the firm deciding how much of their product to bring to the market, whenever you make that decision of how much product to bring to the market, that triggers a labor and capital decision as well. Because in order to make that specific amount of your product, you're gonna to have to hire a specific amount of labor and, and also purchase a specific amount of capital. So therefore the economy is this gigantic tangle um, of interconnected you know, things. Um, all the sort of various parts of the economic system from education systems uh, to infrastructure, to laws and rules, to individual decisions, consumer decisions, producer decisions, and, and all the various markets that are involved in all of these decisions. I think it's important for us to sort of step back and, and really look at the complexity of this. 
and understand that, you know, sometimes simple economic stories are also very complex economic stories. And there's a rich story often to be told if you just peel back the onion just a little bit. So the way this works is that firms employ inputs, they purchase an amount of capital and labor. They then organize those inputs in the context of their production function. So you can, you know, the straightforward example of this is you have a factory floor where a product, let's say shoes are being made. So the firm has, you know, first decides how many shoes do they want to make this week. They determine how much rubber and how much cotton for the shoelaces and all the other things that go into their shoes, how much of those physical products they need in terms of inputs. And then of course, how many employees they'll need to uh, hire in order to make that particular amount of product. Then their production function organizes those inputs. When I say organizes, what I mean is that the way that businesses really operate is they connect capital and labor. And, and sometimes, you know, there's a lot of labor and very little capital, and there's a lot of capital and very little labor, right? We'll, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more later on. Uh, but, you know, the production function of a business organizes their inputs. And, and by organize, again, I mean matches capital and labor, right? So you have, you know, skill-based decisions being made by your employees, which are the way in which they're making those decisions is by using particular capital. So again, if I'm a shoe manufacturer, I probably have a combination of, of handwork, that is that, that some of the shoe construction has to be done by human hands. And then there's probably other parts of the shoe that can be made by machines. And so I need people that understand how to work the machines. I need, I need people who, who have the skills to you know, do the hand, hand uh, skill component of the shoe. And so I'm organizing the capital and labor uh, that I have uh, in order, again, to produce that profit maximizing uh, amount. And so then the firm produces that profit maximizing amount. Again, Q is a decision by a firm, which springs also a capital and labor decision. Um, and again, we can think about firms as being capital intense. This means they use a lot of capital uh, and, and perhaps a little bit less labor. So these would be like your, your automated uh, businesses like mass produced food is highly often automated with very few people in the factory actually, usually people just making sure uh, that the machine is running well. Um, so that would be about a capital intense industry. And then you have like a labor intense industry where, you know, and, and the way you think about intensity here is how much, you know, in a relative sense, does your business need capital and labor? Right, and in a mass produced food uh, factory, you need a lot of capital relative to labor. Um, if you're a newspaper, you need a lot of labor relative to capital, right? So in that, in that sense. Um, and so, you know, there we can think about markets and we can think about industries as being capital intense or labor intense. Um, and sometimes you have uh, industries which are both, which are both capital and labor intense and, and those tend to be, you know, your really big industries. You think about like department stores, for example, uh, very capital intense because you often have massive distribution uh, protocols to get your product to various department stores. And then the department stores have to be staffed, not just with the individuals that are working the floor, but with the individuals that are uh, packing the store and so on and so forth. And so it, it isn't just capital intense and labor intense. You, you can sometimes have both. Uh, that's 